Thank you all for coming out to our final event in the Scott Science Scholars STEM event series for the spring semester. Obviously, we'll be doing this again starting in the fall, so be on the lookout for the schedule coming up beginning of next semester. So I want to introduce our guest speaker today. This is Mr. John Neal. He graduated from uh, the University of New York at Buffalo with a bachelor's in geology and then went on to graduate from Florida State University with a master's in geology. And post-graduation, he started working with the Chevron Corporation. He did that for 34 years in a variety of departments, working with a variety of different groups inside the organization. I don't want to speak on that too much. And now he is retired and he is leveraging his knowledge and experience and going around and designing uh, lectures about the careers in earth sciences, as well as uh, lectures that leverage those experiences specific to the uh, energy sector. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Neal. Appreciate y'all coming. <clears throat> Hopefully uh, something I'd say here will perk your interest. Um, I will say, first of all, how many of y'all are in the environmental studies program? Biology? <laughs> okay, I'm wondering who the audience here is. What? Who else do I have here? Environmental science. Okay. Chemist, a lot of chemists as well. Okay, good. Chem chemists, uh, you don't have an engineering program. We do, yes. And some of this will tie into that as I go through a, a chemist, a, a, ge a geologist, which I know you don't have here, and engineers, um, are going to be important solving some of the things that I'll be talking about and put out there in the beginning, I'm not anti wind, solar, renewable, but having the experience just in life, you never want to put all your eggs in one basket, they say. We need all energy sources. We got to find a way to utilize safely and environmentally all our energy sources. So I started this of course COVID sitting there thinking about things and all of a sudden started coming up with topics. So unintended consequences, and I've got renewable in quotes, and I'll get to that. And this is only part one at this point. Electric vehicle batteries. I was gonna start with solar panels, but then I thought about it. I said, you know, EVs and EV batteries are gonna be more impactful to you personally, potentially, than the solar panels. So, you went through the introduction there. The one thing I will add, I've worked in exploration, development, and in environmental divisions. And I'm kind of surprised that the people from the environmental groups didn't take the bait on this one. Uh, we worked all around the U.S., got to travel. Uh, it's a company that uh, does hire specialists. If you go on in uh, chemistry, they've got research and development and that kind of stuff. So goals for today's presentation, what I'm really trying to instill in y'all is a desire to fully research something. We, we get a lot of elevator talk on the news about topics. They never go into details about, okay, well, what's the whole process like? So that's that's really my desire is to get, it, get you to think about a process for anything in life and explore the full extent of a life cycle or what I call cradle to grave comes from an environmental research time, both the pros and the cons on the two. So this one is that what underlies the production and disposal of EV batteries. Everybody says EV batteries, great. But that's all we say. Don't know about the beginning and the end of all of it. And what I'll be presenting is a much more in-depth process I'm talking about for EV battery from the beginning of the process to disposal and identify the unintended consequences. Everything in life, almost everything, has unintended consequences. And when you start thinking in that, you start planning for it and knowing what it's going to impact. And I'll be using what I call the cradle of rate. It's just the life cycle, where it begins and where it ends. So I love questions. So I hope I get a lot at the end, but if you can hold them, I'll get through because I crammed a lot of this talk. <laughs> Try to keep you awake. So renewable, you hear that all the time. Solar and wind, you know, are, are renewable. Yeah, they're always there. 
that nobody mentions, if you have a device in between to convert it to energy, electricity, right? So solar panels, wind turbines, in order to build that intermediate device, it takes things, minerals, uh, metals, everything from the earth. Many of them, well, there's enough iron out there mm -hmm. for, I don't know, a million years, but a lot of them are not renewable. So solar panels, wind turbines are no more renewable energy than gas, oil, coal, or any of the others. So that's something we got to plan for in the future. Uh, they're already running out of some of the uh, lithium. They got to look for more, which they'll probably find. But it's a, a problem that just now is hitting them as sales ramp up. So electric vehicles, cradle to grave, life cycle. There's our mining. Mining is pretty much the beginning of everything. And disposal. That's what was great about being a geologist, earth scientist. Everything you have, you pick up, put on, it all starts with the dust. There's nothing that's a that you can and think about this for the end because it's a question I ask at classes I taught at Chevron. Name me one thing that you could pick up, hold <clears throat> that doesn't start with the earth. And there is one answer. Okay, so materials such as lithium, cobalt, manganese, graphite, copper, uh, aluminum, and nickel are needed to manufacture anything bad or trash. And funny enough, um, petroleum products, it's all encased in plastic. EVs can be 50 some percent plastic. It comes from petroleum. So we can't shut in all the petroleum because you won't be able to be plastic. Uh, these materials acquired through open pit mining. You've probably seen pictures of coal mines. It's uh, most often shown subsurface mining in some case, and also the evaporative pond processes for lithium for the most part. Well, it, I take that back. They do some for rare earth minerals. So all of these have an unintended consequence of environmental impact, huge environmental impact. So it can take just an example. It can take up to 500,000 500, pounds, 250 tons of Earth's crust, Earth, to be moved to produce one battery. And that includes, and don't put in mining, the overburden they got to prove. So there's a lot of destruction going on just for one battery, let alone all that we need to replace. China owns or is involved in the majority of these operations and no deposits. I was just talking about that. They take a long view of everything and they've slowly over the years, cobalt mining and lithium, they've gotten in the rare earth minerals. They look forward earlier than most other countries and definitely our country. We, we've been blind and we're being way unequal in getting these resources. So, we won't be energy independent, even with electric vehicles and the batteries, because they'll be coming for now. We're trying to catch it from China in the majority of the way. And we've seen on the news what's going on with China, so that's not a good place for us to be, especially if we're pushing for uh, zero carbon emissions. Just to refresh everybody's memory, that's what an open pit mine looks like. <clears throat> it's maybe, I'm not sure if this is, it's not a coal mine. Yeah, I believe it is a lithium mine. Um, but for all the things we were talking about, a lot of them are open pit, you know, be it aluminum, be it uh, cobalt. And that one little dot right there, hard to see, I know, but that's a huge dump truck. Most people in here, I'm not sure if they're familiar with Tonka toys. Kid, he had this big tonka, yellow tonka. Well, that's one of those right there. They run 24 7. They run on diesel and they just keep widening that open pit going down. So there's just some more equipment 
in the size of it. And this one always fascinated me. That's when they do a side cut in Australia. They're moving sideways instead of down. So you can imagine they're just destroying the environment on the surface as they cut a huge swath. So all these things are involved in the mining at the beginning. And I'm gonna focus on lithium and the EV batteries. But you can imagine how much this would expand for everything else to get them. This is what a lithium settling ponds in the Atacama Desert looks like. Okay. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with it, but it, it, it's uh, in South America, it's a high, dry uh, <clears throat> desert, very delicate ecosystem up there. And this is what they've started doing, pumping out brine to lithium concentration and going through different settling evaporative ponds until it gets concentrated without it. So you can see they're taking up surface, but also they're taking up uh, water and impacting groundwater that there are people up there that farmers are not used. So they're having an impact, an unintended consequence on the environment of the people who live there. So right now they're ramping up. They're going to take more and more and more area to create these evaporative ponds because the demand for lithium is skyrocketing. So Argentina up there in the uh, the right, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, they're referred to as the lithium triangle. China's in there too. It may be those for this. Oh, yeah, the large areas and the impact of the water. Let me get on this side. So, this just give you an idea who owns right now, who has, is producing the most lithium. You can see uh, Australia and Chile, mostly uh, definitely Australia here, which China is a part of, it, of course. Uh, Chile, China, and the one that interests me was right here. This was the U.S., and you can see the growth, and it's going to continue to skyrocket at this point. So the U.S. at one point we were producing twenty-seven percent. Of the world's lithium, 27%, down to 1%. And our government has said, we can't open any new mines. Not, we've, got, we've got some great concentrations of lithium in our country, but we're not allowed to mine it. So this is a little fuzzy to me. <laughs> you have one of those handouts? I'm going to make sure I get this right. Am I the only one that can't read what's up there in the small print? <laughs> oh, okay, that one, I forgot, that one's not on there. At any rate, this one up here, uh, Australia, Chile, and China amount for 86% of the lithium right now. And, oops, in 2020, they produced 86,300 tons. And the projection right now is to rise by 2025, 1.3 million. I think that's low now, considering the way things are exploding with the auto, auto dealers going, switching over. So that's an 83% increase. And they project before it's all down, there'll be over a 300% increase in production of lithium alone. Remember all the other things that go into a battery besides lithium. So they're going to have to increase along the same numbers. To produce enough batteries to replace all of the internal combustion engine cars with EV cars with electric batteries. And I'll get ahead of myself. I think it was like two, I used it, two billion cars, bought off automobiles on the road. I believe that is in the truck. Two billion. Only we'll two billion EV batteries. And if you go back to the 250 tons to get one bad, not flipping for one battery. You do the math, two billion there. <clears throat> That's a lot of mining to be done. Okay, so here we've got some cradle and grave. Everything starts playing um, for for this, but everything starts with the earth. So you got to mine the lithium. You've got to actually. I didn't put it in here because I couldn't fit it. But there's a transport step. And then you got to process the lithium. 
And then you got to transport the processed lithium to a manufacturing facility for, for EV batteries. Then you got to transport the EV batteries to be installed at a facility. And then you got to transport the EV batteries to the disposal. So this is your high level view of what's going on here. Okay, so, okay, so, all right. Don't forget at each one of those transport, you've got trucks, trains, ships, planes, you name it, that if we're going to need more of these out there or need more of these batteries, you're going to need more of all those transport vehicles. So they, okay, so when I was doing this, this is when my first aha moment came. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Each one of those is going to have a CO2 footprint. It's going to have other environmental impacts. So I said, well, wait a minute. Remember that big Honka truck? Well, where did it come from? Well, it starts with mining. To build one of those Honka trucks, that huge thing. So it's got its own cradle to grave coming off the side. And then all of a sudden I say, man, this footprint's getting bigger than that. So each step of this has a cradle to grave process. Because processing lithium, you need a facility. You've got to build a facility. Where does everything come to build a facility? It starts with mining. And eventually, when you're done with it, it's got a grave there somewhere. Uh, transport, as I said, the ships and everything uh, build out of the metals, uh, run on diesel or bunker oil. Um, so, again, our carbon footprint, which is what we're collecting <coughs> vehicles, is trying to produce for CO2. It's getting bigger for these batteries. Manufacturing, again, a facility. Transport, install another facility. So, all of these have their own cradle grave with impacts to our environment in different ways. And this is just going to grow. We're building battery facilities, I believe Tennessee, there's one to be built here in the US. So this is one of the impacts of, okay, manufacturing. Uh, again, we've got to destroy habitat to build a facility and uh, all the mining and transport goes. It's going to get worse. So just to recap, each one of uh, the mining processes consists of many aspects. The, uh, each one has its great, great process that I just showed. Truck trains, heavy equipment, processing facilities, fresh water. And I guess I'll go back to the Donna truck, just as a reminder, that big open pit mine, 24 seven, with I don't know how many of those huge trucks alone, not even the excavators <clears throat> that are needed. So if we saw one quote, we may need up to like 380 new mines to meet the needs for everything that goes in to the lithium ion battery. So take that, multiply it by how many vehicles they've got going, and all of a sudden the footprint of the cradle grave just went huge. And I've not come across somebody who's encompassed all that into a calculation of how much CO2 is going to be. Uh, created simply to create the batteries, not the cars, just the batteries. Um, so constructing each of the necessary pieces, as I said, starts with the mining. And you can see we look at an overall environmental footprint just for the mining, get materials to go into the EV batteries. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, well, wait a minute, Tonka truck. What's the Tonka truck made of? Well, it's got different components, right? So I went to fish. Again, mining the lithium, mining equipment. So let's take one piece of mining equipment, keep that talk about that. What's, what's it made out of? Well, it's got components. I, I call them components, right? So components of mining equipment. Just put two fish. Uh, then we'll get into some detail on this. But those components have components made up of simply made up of different materials. So cradle to grave for each of those again expands. I'm double dipping a little here and creating the, the truck 
you know, has a footprint starting with mining. But I dug down a little deeper on this. So each of those steps again, they have components that have components, and it goes on for some of them quite a ways. And each of those components starts with a mining process. So here's our Tonka truck. This is where the components totally make some sense. I block you. I'll get back on the other side. I didn't see you over there in the corner. So here's our Tonka truck. There's one component, glass. Glass has a whole separate cradle to grade, right? For finding, mining it, going through the whole process of it to dispose of it. Well, when you think of components, the other ones that are in there, these aren't all of them, but these are some of them. So let's take the transmission, for instance, for starters. Transmissions have different types of metals. The gears are different, the casing's different, it's got seals, it's got transmission fluid, which is, you know, is a component that comes from mining, which is essentially the drilling. So each one of these has components. These are all higher level components for that Tonka truck. And I just didn't have enough room. Each of those has multiple components going on that start with mining. So again, this whole footprint of the impact of converting to EVs and electric vehicles. And I'm not saying not to do it. If it would work environmentally and some of the other aspects I'm gonna show you, I'm all for it. My personal belief is we're not there yet. We're just not there yet. And it, it's something that over time, they gotta give it time. So each of these equipment components, as I said, has a cradle to grave. And you can imagine this thing just expanding and expanding. So origin and disposal of the batteries. So again, China and other countries have been cornering the materials as we discussed. And China started out making batteries to other countries that are doing it. So China is the major producer of these batteries. So again, we're relying on somebody else for our energy. We're not energy. And the U.S. has plenty of these materials to do it ourselves. But the government said, no mind. So we're dependent on somebody else, which is not a good place to be when you've got your own ability go mine and go build your own things, including chips, which we're starting to finally do. Okay, so only about 5% of EV batteries are being recycled. This is another unintended consequence. You know, and right now there's not a, a lot of them, but they're still piling up, just waiting to figure out what to do with them. You can't just bury them because they've got certain materials in them that are hazardous, lithium, for instance. <clears throat> And they've had instances where they've been piling up these batteries. <coughs> Lithium is very, uh, is very volatile. Chemical makeup in the batteries. You, you tend to they leak, explode, catch fire. Battery fire is hard to put. In. We'll get to that. So it's still cheaper right now to build the batteries with new materials. That's one of the reasons that the recycling hasn't really kicked off yet. There's not enough batteries to build a you know, make an economic to build a facility. To start the recycle. So we got to catch 22 going on. And all the batteries aren't built the same way with the same concentrations of, of uh, lithium uh, and other components. So each facility may have to be a little different to handle it safely. So there's a lot of things going on that were unintended that nobody thought about before we started down this road. And this is where, again, I don't think I mentioned it. This is your job. You, the reason I'm presenting this is not to be anti-green energy. It's to show you what's got to be just part of what's got to be overcome. And it's you and your kids that'll have to come up with those solutions. I want you all to get started thinking early on how to overcome them so that we can use it as an energy source. I'm not going to be alive long enough to fix a lot of the problems that we're talking about. So the recycling again, um, it's got its own cradle of the grave for the facility. Um, and what you do with some of the materials 
that are going to require special uh, burial techniques, special uh, hazardous waste dumps to handle what's left over. And EV batteries have, have toxic materials. Um, so again, they can't just be buried. So let's look at some of the unintended. This is another one that was in Aha. Okay. Wait a minute. I don't know if you know, you know, the batteries in the EV vehicles right now have an eight, uh, eight, eight, eight year, 80,000 mile warranty on the battery, or a 10 year, 100,000 mile warranty on the battery. After that, the battery is not warrantied. Okay, you think, oh, okay, I'll just go out and buy a new battery. The batteries could be, especially on the bigger model Teslas, that's half the cost of the car. So batteries can range anywhere in the hybrid from only 4,000 up to $25,000. So you buy a used vehicle that's got over 100,000 miles on it, your battery goes bad, you may be out 20 grand just to get a new vehicle or you got a door stop. And that's happening. To, uh, I read a number of articles. One was a Florida dad who got his daughter, one of the early four, uh, who I'm guessing was a hybrid. Uh, well, no, it had to be some battery costs. They bought the car for 11000 Battery got to the point where it wasn't working. The guy says, okay, well, what's the cost? 14000 for a new battery. For a car, he paid $11,000 for it. And then the guy says, it's even worse. They don't make that battery anymore. It was an early generation. So they had no way getting $11,000 doorstop. There's something to think about when you're going into this. So there is a socioeconomic impact to what's going on that will impact the middle and lower income families. And again, so let's talk about uh, and these numbers, probably 2019 prices have gone up. For an EV, 31,000, uh, Tesla, I don't even know. Some of them could be up in the 200,000, but let's just say, you know, 115,000. So cost of the battery, half of that, you got a high replacement cost you're looking at. So you might think you can just go out and buy a used one. You know, first of all, right now, there's not many used ones out there. It's just start to, to be bought. So this is where I got into the <clears throat> battery life can be up to 20 years. But they go bad earlier, just like anything else. And I guess something I hadn't pointed out, and I don't have a picture of it here. That's something I'm going to Has anybody seen what the EV battery looks like? OK. It's a, it's a tray that sits under the passenger compartment. And it's got almost like they're a little larger, like D-cell batteries. All of this pack, up to 6,000 of them in one battery. So yeah, it's kind of, when I learned that, I'm like, oh, I thought it was just one big battery. No, it's all these little things. So the battery life can be good. It's getting better. But again, after 100,000 miles, there's no warranty. So you're going to take your chance. And that's the warranty I was talking about, the 80,000, 10, 100,000. Cost of the new battery anywhere from 4,000 to 22,000, and that's going up point because the cost of materials. So someone, again, it's over 100,000 miles, would you go out and buy, say that the EV new was a $40,000 EV and you could get it for 20,000, but it had 150,000 miles on it. So no warranty. And, the, and I haven't come across, it. there may be aftermarket warranties on the batteries, but they ain't going to be cheap. The battery replacement costs that much. So again, another unintended consequence of the cost going up. So these people, you know, middle to lower income, you know, yourselves, the college students, can you go out and buy, or would you go out and buy a used EV, own the, the risks of the battery? Most people, you know, in everyday life, nurses, uh, people at the grocery store, you know, anybody, they're not going to have any used cars to buy. If they get rid of all the internal combustion engine cars, what are they going to do? They don't have a vehicle 
at a viable cost with viable lifespan because of the battery. I don't have the answer to that, but it's something everybody needs to be thinking about that you don't hear about. So this is the one I just went, went through. And I know there's other socioeconomic impacts. The first one, a lot of people can't afford an EV. You know, so what do you do about that? Don't know, but nobody's talking about it. So are EV batteries and EV cars better for the environment? And so far, I've given some unintended consequences. Part of me, I, I wish it was. I got nothing against. EVs and green energy. So how many square miles of habitat will be destroyed to meet the increasing demand of lithium, cobalt, graphite, et cetera, that go with the batteries? Um, if we are to convert everything to EVs, and that's what they're pushing for, everything goes to green energy. One egg, one basket. Kind of scary to me. So 500, just to repeat, 500,000 pounds of earth, 100 to 500 uh, need to produce one battery. Um, we will need 2 billion batteries. Do that math. See what you end up with and how much earth is going to have to be moved, how much habitat destroyed. It's huge. How many groundwater, how much groundwater will be used uh, and contaminated? In, in open pit mining, they use a lot of water. And in the processing, they use a lot of water. And when they're done with it, it's contaminated water. They use a lot of acids and, and such. So if you're expanding all that, what are they going to do with all that? How are they going to get rid of it? How, how are they going to mitigate it? We don't see that going on because a lot of it's going on in other countries. The cobalt right now comes from Central Af Africa. And some of the countries have kids down there mining a toxic mineral, cobalt. That's a lie. That they've actually got the kids doing some of the mining. Um, but we never hear or see that. And I'm behind the curtain. So how much waste will be produced just from the mining alone? Okay, you're taking all that overburden. You got to put all that somewhere. So again, unintended consequences. Toxic materials. Uh, how much CO2 will be produced from the great cradle to grave processes. And I've read a number of papers where it says, oh, you know, eventually just using EVs will overcome the CO2 produced from cradle to grave process. But I haven't seen any of them that have expanded it to the cross cradle to grave or the components. You've got to dig down deep to get a true number. And you can imagine that we may be producing more CO2 than we're saving by going to this production line only. And that's something that I haven't done the calculations. I haven't found a paper yet. It's something that I'll be looking for, but it's something that needs to be considered. Okay. Um, yeah, how do we dispose of the batteries we get on? So that's a, a, a summary. So the as I said, the unintended consequences of this are, are big bigger than what I've shown here. This is a, a highlight of what's going on. So in evaluating the cradle grave process, you'll start seeing some of the unintended consequences if you dig into it and understand the environmental, economic, and socioeconomic impacts. The socioeconomic one is going to be huge and our government can't subsidize it enough for most people to be able to afford an EV vehicle right now. So wind and solar power have their own environment. Those are two more presentations I've started putting together along the same lines of what I'm talking about here, but with different minerals and different challenges at this point. So if we plan to convert to these as sole sources of power, we need to understand creative grade for all those environmental impacts. I don't get ahead of myself. Solar and wind. Solar farms, have you seen pictures of what the solar farm looks like and the wind farms, the amount of area they take up? And I've read some papers where the biologists, environmentalists are just crying because they're, they're 
for the building of some of these, they're scooping up the tor desert tortoises and relocating them before the bulldozers come in and just destroy all their habitat. It's always a give and a take here. So it's a thought process and trying to instill here. Okay, some things to think about. And I won't go through all of these, but my list keeps getting longer on this one. Okay. So as the demand for EVs increases, the cost of materials is going to go up, the cost of EVs is going to go up. Um, well, supply of materials keep up with demand. Right now, it's not projected to. They need to find more lithium coming in at this point. Are we ready to stop producing and using fossil fuels now? Can we just shut in the pipelines? Can we shut in gas, uh, petroleum, coal? Who, who thinks we can, in five years, shut in all petroleum production? Anybody here? She's laughing. Because they've not come up yet with a detailed plan, process, timeline of how we're going to switch over to green energy. All the infrastructure that needs to be built, all of the uh, stations for recharging your car that need to be built. I've not seen anything in a time frame, but it's a lot of years to do all that. So by stopping production right now, all that's going to do is make the cost of your fuel for your cars go up and anything made out of plastic go up. Um, again, plastics, there are over 6,000 items in your everyday <laughs> lives that come from petroleum products. Plastics make up 50 to 50% 50 of an EV's volume. So you're going to need petroleum to produce plastics to produce EV cars. Um, how's the electricity produced to charge the EVs right now? 80% comes from fossil fuels. So you can't start shutting all that down now, which even in Tennessee here, they're shutting down coal plants, but they have no replacement for that energy generation. So we may be looking at blackouts, brownouts, rolling blackouts, because they have not replaced an energy source before shutting it down. So 81% again comes from fossil fuels, that's globally. This last one on here, bugs me. Those of us that are older, and I'm closing in next month on 68, I remember what LA looked like in the 70s before they started making improvements in emissions. It was just an orange, it was orange cloud, you couldn't see through. We've come a long way, and the US has done more than any other country to improve our emissions and improve our pollution of, uh, the, uh, of our country, both land, air, and water. For the car, the last thing I remember is catalytic converters, right? And we stopped. As a scientist, I'm convinced, one of my friends said, I, I said I could get it to zero because now there's a diminishing return, a cost benefit. And he's right, diminishing return. But I'm convinced they can go a lot less than what we're putting out of that tailpipe, tailpipe or the stacks uh, for coal generation. They already have scrubbers on them. Yes, it'll cost. But in my high level calculations, it could be a lot cheaper throwing that all out and trying to put, pull in all this new infrastructure. So for your, the chemists and the engineers out there, somebody needs to start looking at that again and finding ways to just take our internal combustion engines for now and pollute less because they just stopped. And I don't understand that. Um, I'll just go high, highlight a few things. You've heard of this maybe on the news because it's starting to come out. Okay. Um, there's distance anxiety, right? For an EV, how long is my battery going to last? Well, in cold weather, you can lose up to 41% of your distance from your battery. And if it gets cold enough, down in the 20s to zero, below zero, like a lot of our northern climes have, that battery won't even recharge because it's a, it's a slush and it's a chemical reaction in here. So as your temperature goes down, that chemical reaction slows down. So something a lot of people aren't talking about. So if you bought a car that gets 200 miles and it's 20 degrees out, you may only get 100 miles. That's going to make a lot of people a little anxious on buying 
and EV. Conversely, getting it too hot, it's not as bad. You know, you only lose about 17%, but on the flip side, if it gets too hot, you could have the batteries exploding on you. You're heating up too much in there and the fires. Um, talked about the EV battery fires. It took, uh, during the hurricane down in Florida, they had some of them. And it took them, I think it was over thousands of gallons of water. And that's what they have to use. And they got to get it under the car because that's where the batteries are. And none of the fire departments around the country, most of them don't know how to handle an EV fire. Parking structures, another one for instance. All our parking structures here, all in Europe, they don't have all the big SUVs and heavy cars that we have. Um, but a battery can weigh a thousand plus pounds, just the battery itself. And in the UK, they realized, can our parking structure structurally take this? They've got to go through and evaluate structurally every single parking structure. Some parking structures won't allow EVs because of the fire hazard, because it will melt the rebar and destroy portions of the parking structure before you put that fire out. So again, unintended consequences. Uh, and I've got handouts that have all these on there, so I'm not gonna go over them all. But the last thing, I'm reading a book um, by Bjorn and I already forgot his last name. Um, but one thing that hit me up front, we need to adapt. We've always adapted. Climate change is happening. Not a, being an earth scientist, I'm not convinced it's as fast as what they're telling us it's going to happen. Um, but we need to adapt. Countries have already adapted. Uh, what's the one that's got the big seawall that closes? When the tide tides come in, goes huge seawalls that come. So they're adapting to protect what they've got now. We've got to be thinking about adaption because we're not going to uh, stop, you know, the, the temperature going up. Again, that's another one people don't understand. We could shut to zero carbon output right now, and the temperature will keep going up because there's a lag of the impact of the CO2 to the heating cycle. So it's going to keep rising uh, for quite a while, but adaption is something to look at at this point. And I'll end with this one. And this, this comes from, I can't read it down here, uh, ourworldindata.org. And that is on the handouts here. Came across this one. So $5 trillion has been spent over the past 20 years on green energy. And you can see the rise in energy demand and you can see the impact of that $5 trillion. How do we close that gap? People are saying we need to 12 years to be completely changed over to green energy or the, or the, or the earth will be dead. Well, I got news for them. We've had five major extinctions in geologic history that got us in one of them down to destroying 95% of the species on earth. And then everything's lost in the game. The earth is gonna be just fine. We may not be just fine, but the earth is not gonna be destroyed. Trust me on that one. So we can keep through throwing money at it, but you can see so far, we haven't been very successful in this mission. That's something else you all need to think about and discuss with your friends and keep tabs on. Because right now, what I see going on is the big push for green energy. There's people out there at the top. They're just going to be raking in the money on this, as in Solyndra, which maybe two, I can't remember how many years ago that one was, maybe too young, but that was the first stab at that solar. And the government gave them 500 million and they went bankrupt. Um, so keep track of the, your tax dollars and where it's going. Because this really opened my eyes. That gap's gonna continue to grow. I don't know if we'll ever catch up. So you all need to spread the idea that you need to take this to heart 
spent my, and I know you're studying your, your own stuff because when I was in college, I didn't pay attention to this. It wasn't going on as much, but now it's critical because the push on you and the rest of us of what they want us to do, they're gonna be taking away choices. If they say no more oil production, they're taking away a choice. No more California, you know, where I worked 14 years, 2035, they're not gonna uh, allow the sale of internal combustion engine cars. You can only buy EVs by 2035. If California for years doesn't have the power right now, they got rolling blackouts, brownouts every year, but they got no plan for increasing the energy it's going to take to charge all the EVs. This is the kind of disconnect that just bothers the heck out of them. You know, and the money, follow the money. That's what I'll tell you at this point. Follow the money. And that's a wrap for me. There's many more things I could expound on, but I think this is enough to get you thinking along the lines of this, solar, wind, 